So thank you very much all for coming this evening. Good evening, bonjour, bonsoir, tense. My name is Paula Simons. I am an independent, nonpartisan senator representing Alberta in the Senate of Canada. I'm delighted to be back here home with you in Amiskwichi on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional home of the Cree, Nakota Sioux, Salto, Dene, and Blackfoot peoples, and in the heartland of the Métis Nation. Bienvenue, mes amis. Je suis très fière et très heureuse d'être ici avec vous, chez nous ce soir. So before we begin some housekeeping, um, you are more than welcome to have your cell phones with you and to tweet using the hashtag, uh, hashtag AB Unbound, which makes it look like we're selling buns. Um, <laughs> but, but, but please put your phone on silent so that uh, it does not <coughs> ring because we are recording this for podcast and we are live streaming. So if you object to being on the live stream <coughs> in any way, it's over there. Uh, don't don't walk in front of that and you should be fine. Um, if you need to get up to use the facilities, this is not a play, that, that's okay. Um, <laughs> they're Thank around you. the corner and the washrooms are both gender neutral, but one of them has a urinal in it. So proceed at your own risk. Uh, <laughs> And, and I want to thank very much uh, all the folks at, at the Fringe at Studio Theatre, at Bridges who've done our catering for this evening, and to Ame and Cynthia, who are my wonderful staff who have helped me to put this event together. So thank you very much to them and to all of you. So now on with the show. Our panel is going to last about an hour, and then there's going to be a half an hour for questions from you in the audience. And we'll hope to take some questions from the live streaming audience, too. So if you are watching the live stream and you have a question, you can type it in below, and Ame will relay it to us when the question period comes. So now we will begin. I don't need to tell you that this has been a challenging time for Alberta and that we face more challenges ahead. And maybe it's that frustration and that stress but I also don't need to tell you that there's been a lot of very ang angry rhetoric and a lot of heated debate about what it means to be a real Albertan, about what our Alberta values actually are and what Alberta culture actually means, about whether we're more than a collection of stereotypes. And I wanted to pull together smart, thoughtful Albertans from across the political spectrum and from a diverse range of backgrounds to discuss those questions. So here with me this evening, um, uh, I'm gonna do, do it in this way, this is, this is where you're sitting. So right next to me is Dr. Dr. Jared Wesley. He's a professor of political science at the University of Alberta, and he's been doing groundbreaking field research asking Albertans who they are and what they believe and what they believe other Albertans believe, and we're gonna let him explain more of that as we go on. Next to Jared is Shannon Stubbs, who is the Conservative Member of Parliament for Lakeland, northeast of Edmonton. And beside Shannon is Dr. Diana Steinhauer, who is an elder of the Saddle Lake First Nation and the new president of Yellowhead Tribal College. And beside Diana is Omar Mawalam, who is an award-winning magazine writer, author, and documentary maker, uh, and who's done some really fascinating work about the culture of work camps, and who has been a longtime observer of, of Alberta culture in general. And next to Omar is Doug Griffiths, a former progressive conservative MLA and cabinet minister, and the author of 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, which is about how not to kill your community. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's it, The title's a joke. Uh, uh, and uh, who's, who's had a career after politics speaking about uh, rural renewal and uh, a rural renaissance. So thank you all for being here tonight. I am honored that you're all here agreeing to do this crazy thing with me. So I wanted to start by throwing a question out to each of you in turn. And I'm gonna start, I guess we'll start, we'll go back and forth through the evening, but we'll start with Jared and work this way. I wanna ask you if you define yourself as an Albertan and what does being an Albertan mean to you? Um, I don't. Um, I, I think like a lot of people uh, from Alberta who aren't from Alberta, we identify more closely with the place that's places that we were born and raised. Um, so I was socialized uh, into thinking of myself as being Canadian. I'm from Treaty 1 territory in Manitoba. Um, I come from a biracial family, so I don't have many of the ethnic identity elements that a lot of other people carry with them every day. Um, so I think the closest I'll get to saying I'm an Albertan is that I'm a Western Canadian. Um, but I also think that growing up 
next to Winnipeg and watching the Edmonton Oilers beat us in every <laughs> playoff series uh, made being an Albertan that much more difficult. But my daughters <laughs> will probably grow up to identify as Albertan. All right. <coughs> Shannon? That's very interesting. Um, yes, without a doubt, I, I do uh, deeply and strongly self-identify as an Albertan. But I can tell you um, the worldview from which I approach that, it's as a first-generation Albertan um, with a father and his family from Nova Scotia, with a, a deceased mother and her family from Newfoundland, with a stepmom and all her family from Ontario and Quebec, and um, who was born and raised on a farm in the rural area that now I represent, along with my husband who comes from though a multi-generational more than 110 years of um of albertans so um yeah i very much self-identify um with uh, my provincial membership and i hope that we can get into some of these characteristics uh throughout the evening but i would say that there is a binding um, quality for Albertans and Albertans by choice. And it is around, you know, risk-taking, innovative, adventurous, ambitious, aspirational, imaginative, um, self-reliance, frankly, brave people who have come and, uh, and built our province all together in a relatively young life within our diverse federation. And Diana, what about you as a, as a First Nations person? Do you identify as an Albertan? Mm -hmm. Nigana Naskama Mamo Thangmao, Nanaskama Nanutskami Agisigak, Kitatam Scott Nawao, Kakyo Nawagamagantik, Nimiwaitin Gawapa Mittagok. I want to first acknowledge um, the Creator in giving us this beautiful day and acknowledge and state, as though I'm shaking hands with each one of you, that I'm happy that you are here. I also want to acknowledge the territory of the Papas Jazz people, whose lands that we occupy at the moment and that we're uh, privileged to sit together and discuss this topic together. And in answer to that question, I am a member of a distinct uh, legally binding nation nation or um, distinct separate nation that negotiated distinct legally binding um, political and economic agreements in the form of treaties that are still in force <coughs> and effect today so my ancestry predates alberta alberta became a province as a result of the treaties and the treaties were not land surrenders we are still underlying title holders to all the lands that Alberta claims. And the NRTA Act is basically, um, was never consented to by our nations. And therefore, we are identified within the NRTA as subject to other interests. And Alberta has, therefore, administrative control over lands and we have never given our consent. So I just want to put that out there as that's who I am, and that's my position in terms of Alberta. So I predate Alberta, and as a result of those treaties, allowed for settlement and immigration on our lands because we shared these lands. They weren't sold under treaties. So I just want to clarify that. Thank yeah. you for the question. All right, yeah. and Omar. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in Slave Lake, or I was born in Slave Lake, grew up in High Prairie, and save for three of my 34 years, I've lived in Alberta. I, you know, flirted briefly with Vancouver, but you know, that wasn't, <laughs> you know, it was never going to work out between us. <coughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, and, and um, but I used to... I think I used to kind of shy away from that a little bit because I, I felt like I didn't really fit in with the, um, I don't know if we want to call it like the Alberta stereotypes or just sort of the the immediate image mm -hmm. that people have of Albertans or even the, the image that I, uh, the characteristic that, that I conjured when I thought of Albertans. And maybe there was a little bit of uh, shame as well in, in, in addition to that not feeling like I didn't quite fit in. But now I, I kind of, 
want to reclaim it. I want people to know that uh, I'm Albert, <coughs> and I'm very proud of that. Um, because I, I think that people have this idea of who Albertans are, what they stand for, what their values are. I'm talking about people outside of this province, but you know, people within it as well. And um, I, I usually don't share a lot of those stereotypical values, and I want people to know that an Albertan can uh, kind of defy their stereotypes. So yes, very Albertan. And Doug. I'd have to say that um, it's evolved for me. I mean, I grew up in rural Alberta in a small town, and, and I have to admit, I. I grew up with this um, chip on my shoulder that I was a rural Albertan, which made me different from everybody else because we were hardworking and independent and entrepreneurial, and we were kind and neighborly and we supported each other. But leaving rural Alberta and s experiencing the rest of Alberta and the rest of the country and then the rest of the world, um, there's nothing that made us different than anybody else. And so I'd say <laughs> I've met hardworking, kind, entrepreneurial people everywhere I've been. And since I focus on community building everywhere I've been in North America and Europe and Asia, I mean, everybody's like that. And I've found that I, I identify less and less as Alberta's distinct or different, and I've found more identity in common around the globe. And so I, I guess I'm still an Albertan, but I would say I'm a Canadian first. All right. So Alberta exceptionalism is... <laughs> is not... <the laughs> but, but I think that's true. I mean, when I wrote my... To apply to be a senator, you have to write an essay about why you would make a good senator. And, and so I wrote an essay in which I said, because I liked this line and I keep recycling it, I am an Albertan down to the marrow of my beefy, beefy bones. And I thought, <laughs> I thought that is a great line. I'm not quite sure what that means, but, but it got me my Senate seat. And so, but, but I, 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 think, I think there is always that tension because we are proud Albertans, but I think for each of us that means a different thing. And I think sometimes the Alberta exceptionalism, you know, you do think, well, you know, are we that unique, you know, have we cornered the market on a particular kind of Albertan virtue? And so I want to turn to Jared, because you have spent the last few, is it months? months? Mm -hmm speaking to all kinds of Albertans, you know, the severely normal Albertans that, uh, that Premier Klein liked to invoke, mm -hmm. and, and so, so also probably some severely abnormal Albertans. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what have you found about what Albertans believe, not just about themselves, but, but what they think their neighbors think Albertans are? Right, so, I'll, well, I'll skip to the punchline, and I'll tell you how I got there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, what we found is that most Albertans share a common sense of what an average Albertan is. But only a small fraction of Albertans actually see themselves in that image. And I think this speaks to what you were talking about, Omar. So we've been spending the last uh, four months speaking with over now, uh, what are we up to, 1,200 Albertans. Um, studying their public opinion through a survey of 800 of them, but, but I think the more innovative piece was that you were talking about earlier is, is our focus groups, which we've done with over 400 Albertans in eight different communities across the province. And the best way for me to explain this research is to actually guide you through the first activity. So we usually provide Sharpies and paper, but you can do this in your mind. So <laughs> if you feel so inclined, um, please feel free to close your eyes. It works better if you do. Okay, folks at home can do this too. Um, I'm going to give you a simple instruction. In your mind's eye, I want you to draw me an Albert. Okay, now don't fight, fight the tendency to rewrite what the first image that popped into your head was. Okay, I want you to go back to the first image that popped into your head. Now that Albertan could be standing next to something, standing in front of something, behind something, could be doing something. We did this in Saskatchewan, too, and uh, one person drew a, a, a man standing beside a tree uh, and a hill, and I said, what's with the tree and the hill? And he said, it's the only tree and hill in Saskatchewan. But anyway, <laughs> um, now that Albertan could be, uh, could be wearing something, holding something, okay? So I want you to just emblazon that image in your mind, okay? Now I want you to name that Albertan. Give that Albertan a name. Okay? And I want you just to think for a brief second about their backstory, where they come from, what they do, 
do they have family, and so on. Now, we've done this exercise with 400 Albertans. What do you think we see in those images? How many people drew a cowboy? Or a rancher of some kind? <laughs> a farmer? farmer? An oil field worker? Okay. Better question, how many people drew somebody who wasn't male? A fraction, right? How many drew somebody who wasn't white? A fraction, right? And what we found through follow-up interviews with, with folks that raised their hand with those last few questions is that um, they were conscious in doing so, that the first image for most of them that popped into their mind was that stereotypical Albertan. So we used that image then to guide them through a series of activities. We asked them, I, I don't, didn't care about their, their personal opinions in these focus groups. I told people that. I don't care what your personal opinion is. I want you to tell me what Stan thinks. I want you to tell me what Joe thinks. It's, incidentally, most of the names started with J. I named mine Jerry, so. Right? Yeah. Really? How many people did somebody with a J that starts with a J? Joe, John, <laughs> Jake, Jacob, Jacob, Jingleheimer, Schmidt, or something like that. It has to do with, that actually, a lot of J names are biblical. So you can delve into these pictures alone would tell us a lot, but we did more. We said now, pick which one is the, is the quintessential Albertan among the eight people that were around the table, and it was usually Joe, Stan, and so on. We asked them, how much power do you think Joe has in Alberta society? They said a lot. How much does politics revolve around Joe? They said almost always. Is this how Albertans see themselves? A as a community, like the, the most quintessential Albertan, this is how Albertans see, them, see, see the quintessential Albertan. What about people from outside the community? This is how they see them. So there was consensus on what it meant to be the quintessential Albertan. Yet I looked around that table, and very few people looked like that. We then asked them to go through a series of activities reacting to things like political cartoons. Would Joe find this funny? What would Joe think about this particular news story or this particular policy initiative? And we came to understand that there is a lot of consensus as to what are the clear boundaries of political correctness and social acceptability in Alberta. That's the political culture that we found. And there's a consensus around that, as there is in most communities. A political culture is not what everybody agrees with in terms of their personal opinion, but it is still very powerful. It tells us things like we should not go out on a limb and propose a PST. Why? Because Joe would never go for that. Right? Or we should not um, change uh, saying, happy holiday, or saying happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, because Joe wouldn't go with that. Right. Um, but interestingly, and I'll close on this, Paul, because I know we want to move on, but um, the average Albertan Joe does see a role for government in a lot of things. Joe does see a role for them in health care and seniors' care. And we probed, Joe, probed things about Joe's attitudes towards persons with disabilities, other marginalized groups, including the LGBTQ community. Joe actually is pretty laissez-faire when it comes to that kind of stuff. He's not socially conservative in that way. And we can talk about how that is actually what we see when we see public opinion surveys that show that Albertans aren't any more right-wing than the rest of Canada. I'd say, no, they just don't prioritize those people's issues, <coughs> those communities' issues. So anyway, that's what we've learned so far. That's after four months worth of research. So I wanted to, to get your reactions to that. Um, Maybe, Omar, I'll start with you, because I'm going to pop around here. I mean... I'm, I'm surprised by my own uh, lack of imagination in that experiment. Because my, <laughs> I mean, my, my parents are Lebanese immigrants. Uh, my extended family has been living and, and settling in um, Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 um, in southern Saskatchewan since Oh, as early as 1910. Um, so, you know, I know that that's not true. I, but you know, um, Riley, I named him Riley, uh, was <laughs> the first guy that popped in in my head, and he was, you know, pretty much Joe, less religious than yeah. the the Joe Joe's not that religious. you. Uh, <laughs> um, he's totally fine with Happy Holidays, uh, Riley. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm surprised by the fact that like I grew up in an environment where. Um, a lot of the people, almost all the people that were closest to me um, did not look or sound like Joe, and yet, um, 
and there were dozens of them all around me, and yet when I think of, of, of an Albertan, I don't think of the people on my own family tree and my own ethnic community. Yeah, I mean, and what does that say? That, I mean, my family, like on, on the Jewish side of my family, they've been here for, like, <clears> since <throat> the, the early, early 1900s. But do Jewish people, are those real Albertans? You know, I mean, do I... It's interesting because when people think of an Albertan, they don't think of a Muslim, they don't think of a Jew, they don't think of a Sikh, uh, and sadly, a lot of the time, they don't think of an indigenous person even though they got here first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, the question, I think, of this panel is, you know, what is Alberta culture? How do we define it? And I'm, I'm not sure if there is an Alberta culture. As Doug was saying, I mean, what we think of as Al Alberta values are, are maybe just like attitudes that are, um, universal but maybe more prevalent here. Um, but if anything, I think there's an Alberta mythology. There's an Alberta story that we tell ourselves, include like that I tell myself, mm -hmm. um, not actively, mm -hmm. it's just, it's there. And I tell myself it every day, um, just sort of in the background. And um, I think that's something that is uh, really easy for, uh, for politicians to pander to. I think that's something that, uh, it's easy for corporations to pander to, um, but it's really difficult for anyone to kind of break through that story, to unravel that story and tell a new one. Yeah, see, the interesting thing is how many of us thought of a rural person oh, yeah. when, in mm -hmm. fact, Alberta is one of the most urban mm -hmm. places in North America, and there's been this increased, you know, f f flow of urbanization mm -hmm. over the last, you know, 75 years that's, that's intensifying even now. So I wanted to ask Doug, there are so many divides in Alberta, north, south, rural, urban. You represented a rural Alberta riding. You've dedicated your professional career to talking about the revitalization of rural communities. So as our province becomes more and more urban, how does that change our sense of ourselves as, as a community in a province? Yeah, it, it actually, um, uh, I, I could talk about this forever, obviously, but you know what? In in rural Alberta, I think there's there's frustration and there's anger um, because there's they're <clears throat> they're feeling a disconnection given the shift in Alberta and the way things are changing. They might feel better the last few months, but that won't last very long. <laughs> um, but but you know what? They I think they're they're um, they're they're angry. And because they feel that disconnect and they feel like their lives are changing. Um, I mean, the next book I'm working on is, is um, Renaissance of Revolution, the Re-Rise of, of Rural America, North America. And I, revolution is crossed off be, because they're, from my experience traveling around all over North America, the, a lot of rural communities are feeling frustrated. And they, revolution is, is about anger and about taking something back. And yet nothing's been stolen from them. The world has changed. And so I, I think um, all rural communities across North America need to realize that it's time to embrace a renaissance, a change um, that, that's not going to make their way of life go away. It will make it better. The resistance to the change that's coming um, will make them obsolete. And, and, but there's so many people that just want to hold on to the way things were. And I think they're, they're sensing that disconnect in the way things are shifting, and they don't know where they fit in. Um, and, you know, I. I I was in politics for 13 years. I've been through rehab. I'm not going back. <laughs> it's exactly like that. <laughs> but, yeah. That is wrong. But I but will not. say that, you know, the, the biggest challenge I think we have that's holding rural Alberta back in lots of rural communities is that that anger is being fed. And that's what's preventing them from moving on and getting, um, moving forward into a, a new economy and a, a new evolution. All right. I, see Sh I see Shannon shaking her head, and so <laughs> I would love to get Shannon's reaction to that. Yeah, so um, I guess I'm going to stray off of what your original question was, and I might need help kind of articulating myself on this. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I've promised Paula that I'm going to do my level best not to be partisan. No, and I, and but I, I, want, I, I want us, to, I want us to, to debate and to discuss. This um, is good. And, I, and so, I, so I'll demonstrate a side of myself that might not be apparent in the 35 seconds I have to ask a question in QP. Um, <laughs> very strongly for the 84% of people in Lakeland who sent me there to do that job for them. Um, I'm a little bit confused, I guess, about this whole discussion because I, I grew up um, right outside of a very small village called Chipman on a farm, 250 people out there. Then I went to Lamont High School and 
And, um, but I guess I tra I've already articulated that I think I, you know, I have a perspective on the country because of my background too. And I think what's actually happened is that rural Albertans and all Albertans have, um, like there has been a failure of imagination and there has been an acceptance of stereotypes about ourselves within our province and there are stereotypes outside of our province. So I remain, I, I do believe in Alberta exceptionalism. I, but first of all, I would say, so I'm gonna try to try to unpack about 18 different things here. I, um, I thank goodness the speaker isn't here. That's why I almost get caught, kicked out over. Um, so I, first of all, every single province and region is in this country is unique. I've been to all, I've been to all the provinces and to half, two of the territories. I mean, they are unique. That is, that is the promise and the success and the blessing and the celebration of Canada. They're all unique and they are diverse. But I believe fervently there absolutely is, maybe not this idea of an individual Albertan. Well, I know there's not an individual Albertan, but I do believe there is an ethos and a character and an imagination that binds all of us because it's what brought people from around the world and across the country to come and build this province. Now, I might get into a, making a case that it would be related to free enterprise principles that attract economic development, therefore provided opportunities. Uh, you know, we could get into that. I, I think that's why. So I do firmly believe there is, a, there is an Alberta spirit. Um, but I myself didn't really picture this one individual archetype, Al uh, archetype Albertan. And I think it is based on this, now I don't know if I'm rambling here, but being, it's the stereotype that we've applied to ourselves and things we don't even know about ourselves. So I represent a riding that goes from Burgerheim to Wandering River to the uh, Lloyd Minster and down to Paradise Valley. I usually say if you're anywhere in Northeast Alberta, you're probably in Lakeland at some point. Well, I represent a city, Canada's only border city, that is the youngest median age of any city in Canada. <coughs> and how many people know that the oldest Lebanese community in Canada is north, um, west of us in Lac La Biche, right? And um, how many people reflexively know that the Fringe Theatre Festival is the world's largest performing arts festival on planet Earth? Well, lots of Albertans don't even know that. Um, and I think it's true that there are stereotypes about us elsewhere, and they don't know that either. But I, I think sitting here maybe having imagined that I would be one of the people who would be able to imagine an individual Albertan I actually didn't because Alberta is much more diverse yes. and comprehensive and complicated and nuanced in all of these ways that I fear we don't even know about ourselves. And um, that's what makes it difficult for us to tell that story to the rest of the country and to the world. And it's about time we do learn these things about ourselves and we start talking about it unapologetically in all our diversity and all the differences right across the province. I mean, we're a province that has the most protected heritage sites in all of Canada. We're the province that had the first environment minister in all of Canada in the 70s. We've led the continent on environmental policy, going decades back, we can get into some of these things. We've, uh, you know, we, we have first of female leaders, the first elected female ever in Canada was in Alberta, it was an alderman in, in Calgary. Um, the first female judge came from Alberta. The famous five got the franchise for other Albertans. Um, we have the first indigenous senator, the first Métis senator, um, which actually the village of Hardesty, which Doug used to represent, is named after. The first indigenous lieutenant governor, which Dr. Steinhauer is a descendant of. I mean, this is Alberta. And so that's why, um, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about <laughs> us as a province and as a people, but we're doing ourselves a disservice and the country and the whole world if we, um, if we are not talking about the spirit and the <clears throat> ethos of our population and trying to imagine one single person. I'm sorry, I, I don't know if no, any of that well, makes I, sense. I, but I think what, we're maybe also doing like a disservice by, by listing a bunch of anecdotes like you just did. And, and there's, there's a lot to be proud of. Oh, no, but I when, you, but when you start to facts. build those, those anecdotal facts into... They're not anecdotes, so they're facts. But if you... Okay, but they're anecdotes <laughs> about Alberta, about Alberta history. And you try to build a story about what Alberta is, and if the, if, if the truth doesn't really necessarily add up to them, so I mean, you brought up Alberta's environmental record. Now, if we were to try to take some anecdotes about 
good things that we've done environmentally, and string them together about an argument about Alberta having a good, strong environmental record, how long before the rest of this, this, this country kind of punctures that story, and then points to records that have not been so environmentally friendly. Yeah, because I, I would agree with you, and I think- I mean, we just closed we're, we're how many that, parks- We're living that in real in this, time. In this province. We're, right. Okay, I'm not a, I'm at the provincial government, but we're. No, I'm not, no, no, I'm not, I'm not accusing you of being. Yeah, a no, part to, of that. I totally get I'm it. just saying that, like, I, I want to be sincere in how we present Alberta and who Albertans are, and if we want to just like list a bunch of really cool facts about Alberta, that's awesome, but if they don't really add up to a larger truth about this province, such as our environmental record then are we just lying to ourselves? Is well, that the, the disservice? I see what you're saying. Yeah, and I appreciate you saying that because I think the case I'm trying to make is that I don't think there is an Albertan in a box. That's what I'm, that's just what I meant to say. Right. Sure, now, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I think we're gonna get every, I, I think everyone here is going to agree that there is not a uh, Albertan in a box. So I wanna bring in Diana yeah. who, who hasn't had a chance to, to speak in a minute here. Um, mm -hmm. I began tonight, as I, as I begin all of my presentations with a land acknowledgement, with saying you know, that we're all Treaty 6 people. I say that, I don't know how much that means. I mean, if we're going to go forward as Albertans, what do we have to do to acknowledge our treaty obligations and, and acknowledge the roots of this province to their indigenous roots? One very important piece is to become aware and educated about the truth of the settlement of Canada in, in um, its entirety and Alberta also. What happened that expunged that history and why? And whose purposes did it serve? Why is it that in schools um, nothing is taught about indigenous people, Cree people, Blackfoot people, um, the original peoples of these lands. So those are the questions that have to be put forth and the importance of educating based on the truth. And uh, our voices have been pretty much quelled over the last 150 years, given um, settler colonialism and that has to be unpacked for people as well so that they can understand the truth of um, the annihilation of our peoples over that history and the violence that occurred as a result of um, that annihilation, that we have really survived a genocide. And that's the truth. And what does that mean? We have survived a genocide meaning we have been here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We have survived an ice age. We have survived a flood. We have survived several, uh, what we call renovations of the earth. So we have survived a genocide, which speaks to the resilience. I don't like to use that word resilience, but the fact that our foundation is based on spirit. We are people who believe in spirit and that is what has maintained our longevity here and our perspective as a result. We have a message to all of Alberta, all of Canada, that we must get over ourselves. <laughs> we must get over uh, the divis divisiveness and um, all of the categories that have been created over time and recognize that we're all human beings. We are all part of the human family and that we, the indigenous peoples, and I don't even like using that word. <laughs> I am from the Nehio Nation. We have welcomed your ancestors to our lands with open arms because we follow the teachings of the original instructions given to us by our creator, which said, these are my children too, 
welcomed them, and we did. And we made treaties. So those treaties are still legally enforced. And those treaties were premised on three principles. And they're very, very simple for human people to realize. And this is maybe the story that I want to leave with, leave with you. And that is that story of what does it mean to live in peace, friendship, and respect with one another? That is where we need to uh, bring it forward and teach our children and our future generations because we want to have seven generations into the future. It's because of those seven generations that made those treaties that we are still here as a peoples. And we want to leave something for our future generations, not just our, our Neheo people, but all of the people of the globe. And so the, that's where we start. Thank you. You know, I was listening to Shannon, and I, I have this real sense of empathy with what you were saying, because when I've been in Ottawa, sometimes it's very frustrating that people have these stereotypical ideas about Alberta, and I, I feel very defensive. Like, I have to, you know, promote, like, you know, I have to boost the province, I have to promote the province. Like, yeah. Alberta is not like that. Yeah. And then I wake up and I look at Twitter, and I see that an oil field service company has made a decal that is appalling, that shows, you know, what is clearly meant to signify the sexual assault of Greta Thunberg. And I think, right, now I have to go back to Ottawa and explain again. So I, so I wanted to ask Omar about that. I mean, you've done a lot of really important journalism looking at the culture of work camps and the culture of the oil fields. And I want to ask if you think that work camp culture, that oil patch culture, what is its what is its influence on the larger Alberta cultural conversation? Oof. <laughs> you have <one> As, <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the, when I when I saw that decal, um, child rape. I think is it's it's worth using the term child rape, yeah. uh, which is what was depicted in that. I thought um, I doubt that most of the uh, People, most of the men working in, in oil camps would uh, would approve of that. Of would like not. that. Would find that funny, um, because most of them most of them are parents. Mm -hmm. Most of them are family people, and um, and at their core, they're they're decent people. That stereotype of the you know the the young reckless oil worker with more money than he knows what's you know the, knows what to do with. There was some truth to it for a while um, during you know the early years of the last boom, um, but the, you know a lot of those guys grew up. They got married. Some of them are, got married again, um, <laughs> and uh, you know they're they're in their late 30s, 40s. Some of them are in their early 50s, and what they really want more than anything is uh, stability. Um, and I think they also want to be maybe appreciated for what they believe that they've. Um, given to their families, their communities, their province, and this country. Now, sometimes I think that they um, maybe don't have a always the most realistic view of uh, what it means to be, you know, part of a uh, codependent society. Um, you know, there's I, I so the, just some some context. The, the documentary and the and the writing that Paula uh, referenced before. The documentary is called Digging in the Dirt, and it's a documentary about mental health and uh, and suicide, men's mental health and suicide in the in the oil sands. And um, you know, a lot of there, there's a feeling, a very a very real feeling of alienation and loneliness up there and uh, a feeling that they've been taken for granted, that they are just kind of part of a machine, um, that they, they work, 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 and um, you know when their marriages fall apart or when they sort of become disconnected from their communities, um, you know, a very severe um, feeling of despair sets in. And uh, that's, that's you know, what I was trying to tackle or what we were trying to tackle in the movie. and, and um, in my research. So I think what sometimes gets lost, and not always, because a, a lot of the guys who, have, who we've interviewed who have sort of like been through, you know, they've, they've gone through it and they've come out the other end, they realize now that um, 
you know, there were maybe expectations of them uh, domestically that they didn't quite live up to. But they're starting to become more aware of the fact that there is a culture in those work camps that um, values and rewards aggression, mm -hmm. um, uh, individualism, um, toughness, not asking for help, never showing that you're weak, um, and, and, you know, hypermasculinity. And a lot of the guys that we, that we talked to and that I've interviewed um, realize now that that is actually core to their illness, core to a lot of the problems in their lives. But a lot of uh, people don't realize that. They think it's, uh, they think it's money. They think it's a stable job. They think that it is uh, something that, uh, that a pipeline can give them. And so, you know, there's, I think, a little bit of a disconnect between um, why, you know, why, why they feel this alienation. I mean, you want to talk about Western alienation. This is, this is Western alienation. The the feeling in these in these oil camps that uh, they're really just a cog in a wheel. That's the most alienating, you know, uh, sentiment that I've ever experienced. So yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I think that story of what an Albertan is, how, what our values are, that kind of like toughness, that, gru that, that grit, that gruff pride that I, that when I have it, I'm proud to have, but I also know that that gruff pride is also what can really hurt us sometimes. Um, that is something that is so prevalent there that uh, I just, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if it can, if it can be overcome anytime soon. Now, Doug, you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I, I tell a lot of um, communities that I work with that they really need to analyze the lies they tell themselves. And I think the, everyone does it, and every society does it, and every community does it, <clears throat> and Alberta does it too. I mean, we, we have this, that, that iconic picture of what it means to be an Albertan. And so we tell ourselves these stories like we are independent, except we're a landlocked province and we rely on, <laughs> on everybody else. We tell ourselves we're good fiscal managers. We've just dug oil out of the ground and, and we haven't taxed ourselves to pay for the services we demand. That's not good management. That's poor management. We tell ourselves all sorts of things that say we're these fighting tough people, but, but we make some pretty silly decisions. And I still think the smartest political words that Alberta needs to revisit again were from Jim Prentice when he said, it's time we had a look in the mirror. Yeah, all right. yeah I, we all got mad at him when he said that. Remember that? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> we were like, excuse me, we have to look in the mirror, Mr. Prentice? Uh, uh, Sh Shannon, Shannon is... He might be right about that. Sh yeah. Sh Shannon wants in, and then, and then I have to come back to Jerry because it's been a while since he's had a chance. Yeah, for sure. He probably knows all the things, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the um, things you know. Yes, he knows all the actual things. So, uh, Omar, I think some of the things that you said, um, and I'm not going to speak on their behalf because it would be wrong to do that, but I think a lot of what you're talking about is actually like a cultural and social issue for men. Yeah. Period. Absolutely it is. Um, but, now, I but, might feel quite strongly that they get a pretty rough go on that, actually. And um, that there should be a few more people standing up for the stereotypical men that are wrestling with these things and these pressures and this thing in their life. Um, and I, I guess as a person who lives next door to, has family members, represents um, the very people who work in those camps and live in these farms and in these rural communities, uh, I remember now where I started shaking my head <laughs> when, it, when Doug was making comments because and I'm going to try to do this without being getting really heavy into current policy <laughs> issues. But it, it's not just that they feel that they're being alienated or attacked. And it isn't just happening. It is a direct consequence of policy. And they are losing their livelihoods and their savings and their families and their businesses. And it's not a feeling that they've contributed to their communities and their province and their country. They have. You can see that in the fiscal distribution across the country and where the vast majority of the revenues come from, from the income taxes they get shared across Canada. That, that's all true. And um, it happens, it's, it's got the happy coincidence of being factual, um, but, but it is also exactly as you, both of you are articulating, precisely what they feel. But they're, you know, I guess, 
Um, I don't view it, and, and I think also again as a lifelong like Albertan and a person who worked in policy development, the oil science business unit, the Department of Energy, right before in situ development um, took off. I mean, Alberta is not a story of digging oil that flew out of the ground and was immediately competitive with other oil producing jurisdictions. That's not just that's just not true. It took 30 years of combined effort between multiple levels of government, academics, inventors, private sector proponents to develop. Um, the reserve that makes that of, of which more than 90% is what makes Canada have the top three oil reserves in the world. Um, and so these are some stereotypes even here about ourselves that is not, they're not accurate, right? And so um, I guess I just want to stand up for my friends and my neighbors and the people I represent and my family members and say the rural Albertans who I know are cultur culturally diverse. They're innovators. They're actually on the front lines of transitioning in their jobs and their business in oil and gas and in ag. Um, we were, you know, we were talking earlier about what's happening in terms of uh, going into rooms that we in politics and in your work, and and there aren't a ton of young people. So before this started, we were talking about how this is a challenge that's plaguing. You guys all look fantastic. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you. I said this is an exceptional <laughs> room. Yes, exactly. But that's what we talked about, actually. And um, so we got into a conversation before we started about how this is an issue that's plaguing charitable groups and volunteer organizations, you know, as, as younger people tend to volunteer for a single thing and lifelong sustaining members of or charitable organizations and other, other things are, are, you know, that's yeah. coming to an end. But in rural Alberta, like the people who I represent and live in, they are all those things. They are inventors, they're progressive, they're changing, they're leading change, leading transition, they're forward thinking. They're also, by the way, like diverse and cultural and artistic too. Yeah, because I think that's, you know, I mean, this is a room full of, you know, urbanites um, yeah. who are in a theater space. So, yeah. so, you know, I mean, you're all Albertans, so, here we are. I, so, totally. So, so here, here is the conundrum, though. I'm old. I think I'm older than any of the rest of you on this panel. I remember the National that. Energy Program. I, you know, Western alienation is not a new concept. I don't actually remember the United Farmers of Alberta and and the government of William Aberhart, the social credit. <laughs> but but I've read about them. I mean, Albertans have been feeling angry and alienated for a long time. What frightens me about this latest iteration is how racist some of it is, how homophobic, for like some insane reason some of it is, like, like, like that's an external to Alberta question. Um, so, you know, the racism, the nativism, the sort of blood and soil nationalism of some of this rhetoric, which may be leaching over from from south of the border, which mm -hmm. may be what people, the, you know, the language, the narrative that people are picking up from, from social media. I don't know if there's a way to find a sense of Alberta identity that includes everybody that doesn't get bogged down in that ugliness. And Jared, we have not heard from you for a minute here. So I realize I've not actually <laughs> asked a question. I have just, time. you know, so, so okay, this is, this is your jump in for the last. <laughs> Yeah, so um, first, when we talk about Western alienation as a cultural concept, we all seem to know what it is. I, I would say that, um, you know, white men working in oil camps are not the most alienated people in Western Canada. I've talked to many Indigenous women who would put that, um, put that notion to shame. Yeah, so I think we need to think, again, the, the disjunction between culture and reality is worth reflecting on. Um, this, and I'll be talking at great length on this on March 17th over at... <laughs> the um, Riverbend Public Library. So I'll just give you the snapshot of this. This is not your grandfather's and grandmother's Western alienation. And there's a key difference. This builds on what you were talking about, uh, Doug. Um, there was a sense in previous generations that Alberta was being held back somehow, right? That we were being uh, oppressed. But there was always a sense that we were far ahead of everybody else, right? This latest round of Western alienation has a different feel to it. It was not just that we're being held back, but we feel like we're, we're being left behind or that we're falling behind everybody else. And there are some indicators of that. I mean, look at economic growth. Quebec's on pace to outpace us, which riles some folks up <laughs> yeah, that, in that particular. Yeah, that was the highest insult. Right? <laughs> <You said that. laughs> um, but this cuts back to Alberta's 
conservative political culture. We found ample evidence of that Alberta's political culture is conservative. And embedded in that is a zero-sum attitude. Zero-sum games, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, just means if somebody else, if somebody wins, somebody loses. So if we see somebody else getting ahead, that must mean what? We're falling behind. And the fabulous book that you're writing, you should come to, I don't know, I'm just pumping events now. April 9th at the <laughs> University of Alberta, Kathy Kramer, who's won awards for her studies of, of, of this politics of the Rust Belt in Wisconsin, found this, that when uh, white males and people who are in family units with white males saw Barack Obama as president, they felt a sense that they were falling behind. Not that they were. Objectively, we can look at their pocketbooks, we can look at, look at the representation of white men and white women in Congress, far outpaces black men and black women, okay? We know that objectively. But there was a sense that they were falling behind. When they saw Hillary Clinton, there was a sense that they were falling behind. I've done research here in Alberta that shows, particularly in rural parts of the province, southern parts of the province, seeing Rachel Notley mm -hmm. brought up some of those feelings among, among uh, among certain people. So there's an edge to this. You talk about the racial edge. It comes from that zero-sum mentality that's embedded in conservative political cultures where if somebody else that doesn't look like me is getting ahead, it must mean that I'm falling behind. Even if even if you're not. It's not. It, folks, we can talk all about, and I appreciate the, the and I'm not, but I'm not picking on you here. I appreciate the lovely facts that are absolutely true about the great things that are here in Alberta. That's not part of the story we tell ourselves. We should just call this, this panel the story, this, the stories we tell ourselves. <laughs> but I'm a student of political culture. The stories we tell ourselves are far more powerful than our own individual personal opinions. The stories that we tell ourselves actually hamper us or hold us back from making our opinions felt. I heard a passionate plea from several of you up here saying we need to start telling a different story. Good. It's hard to start telling a different yeah. story because it's not going to fit into the existing narrative. That's politics. Mm -hmm. um, totally. I'll leave it on a good note, though. Um, what surprised us from all of these, these drawings and the stories we heard about people, um, what the average quintessential Albertan was, I was expecting to see the Marlboro Roman. 50, 60, 70-year-old men. We saw a few. We actually saw some people draw dead people, like people that had passed away, right? <laughs> Which was a little weird. The average, the average age of the quintessential Albertan was in his 30s. And what we saw from that was that there was no social conservatism. They did not go to church on Sundays, for, for example. They did not have a knee-jerk reaction against um, people who have substance dependencies, right? the way that Joe Sr. might have. And I'll close on this. And it comes from what you talked about, Omar. The fact that conservatives, conservative minds, are bent towards um, having to have personal experience to empathize with someone. So look at the opioid crisis in, in rural parts of the province. There's an empathy there. Why? Because everybody knows somebody. You said that there would be a knee-jerk reaction against the Greta Thunberg um, decal. Well, you said it yourself. It's because, well, I have a daughter, or I have a wife. That we know from research that that's the conservative mind. You have to know somebody, oh. right? Um, I can't resist this as a closing comment, too. I mean, you talk about hypermasculinity, and it's part of Alberta's political culture more generally. It becomes toxic masculinity when good men don't say something about it. So you said, I'm, I'm sure on an individual level, individual men would find that decal offensive. But the fact that they don't say anything about it turns it into locker room talk. Well, and, that's, and that's part of our culture. I think we have to recognize that, and more of us need to speak out against it. I don't know if they didn't say anything. I mean, that decal was not uh, going around very long before a lot of people were saying things about it. But, but I, I do understand what you mean by, uh, you know, when it becomes toxic, because, um, you know, the, the culture of, uh, you know, the, hey, you don't, you don't feel good today, well, you know, suck it up. Uh, don't say anything, keep it quiet. That's, that, that is the same sort of toxic masculinity. Um, but in this particular example, I don't know um, if they were necessarily silent about it. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I don't know how long that decal was going around for be, before uh, the overwhelming voices that condemned it came through, but... We've got bumper stickers, people holding up posters saying that Trudeau's a traitor and they want to hang him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's toxic masculinity. Sure. That's the tribalism 
in our politics now that it's turned our previously adversaries, people who we believed in the ultimate objectives of our democracy, we believed ultimately we could have a beer with them into our enemies where we need to vanquish them and defeat them. Yeah, right? This is should, part of the toxic masculinity that's part should, of You should culture. look at my inbox. Yeah. Uh, I but, mean, but I would say the, I mean, I guess mine too, Paula. Yeah. And, I mean, to, and to, I, be, to be a woman in public life. Yeah, but so I guess what I hesitate here is, like, I think these are individuals, things. Like, there's... I think we could find countless examples where individuals do dumb things or they're bad people or they say stupid things. And I just am, I, I am very hesitant to then apply it collectively. Well, which, the litmus which, test well, is the which I'm we not surprised. suggesting is necessarily I mean, happening here, but I think can happen. And, and yeah. it, I just I have some discomfort with that. The litmus test is were we surprised? And the were we surprised that this happened in Alberta? And the point about, it's your point about the, it's kind of, that's interesting, thank you for the, the thought, um, for the analysis about a conservative mind. So being the person who's sort of like the most openly labeled conservative here, <laughs> what's, uh, although I, I think we could have a debate about what that means in real time, um, because I do have a political philosophy background, so maybe I'll just come to your <laughs> classes and, and blow this whole pop stand, but um, I, uh, you know, there, I'm sure that, D I know Doug grappled with this too, being elected, there of course are, spectrums, I think, which all fall in our politics and self-identify as conservatives, which might be classical liberals, small c conservatives, a whole gamut of conservatives, libertarians, da da da. So we, we are boxing and labeling even while we, while we say we're not. But as the person who's sort of, I guess, the most openly identified as a conservative, I think the issue that I was trying to press by talking through some of these things that I'm pretty sure most Albertans don't even know about themselves, never mind, or about our province, never mind the rest of the country and the world, is that I'm the one openly identified as a conservative, but I'm also trying to be the exact person saying, these are stories mm -hmm. we tell ourselves. Yeah. And we've to mm -hmm. told stereotypes, we've told our st ourselves and defined ourselves in our province based on stereotypes. Well, and, so and that's just the case I'm trying to. Yeah, and, and we're defined that way too. I mean, I, I made this comment on Ryan Jesperson's show today, but I'm gonna say it again because I liked saying it. Um, you know, the day that Greta Thunberg was here, marching in the streets of Edmonton, and thousands and thousands of Edmontonians marched with her. And the CBC's lead story was about five guys from Red Deer who drove up with trucks, and they did not talk to one single one of the young people, uh, including mm. my daughter, who were marching mm. in the street. Mm. The day that there was that remarkably moving memorial at the University of Alberta for all of the Edmontonians, and indeed all of the Canadians who died in the plane that was shot down over Tehran, and thousands of Edmontonians, they had to turn people away. Thousands of Edmontonians came out to mourn these Iranian Canadians and Iranian students. And the, the story instead was about five guys who were standing outside the legislature being really right wing. And I oh, do man, get frustrated. Did that happen? Yeah, I, and I do get frustrated that, yeah. that I think there is the risk of sounding like a redneck Albertan. I do think there is a central Canadian default narrative there absolutely is. That, that paints us in that way. And I think the challenge is for us not to play into that narrative, yes. um, you know, by, by underlining it. So oh, Cynthia, 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 okay, I, I, Cynthia is making five, is making fingers at me. So, um, I, well, okay, I, <laughs> I, I, I wanna maybe, tell a, a nice story uh, about what it means to be Albertan. And this, this would probably be my, I think maybe my proudest, uh, the, the moment that, it, that makes me the most proud to be Albertan. Uh, but I'm gonna start it on a slightly negative note by addressing that Greta Thunberg <laughs> rally. Um, I was there and I did hear a lot of people complain about the fact that the counter protesters were overblown there were a lot of counter protesters. And if we keep, if we were to pretend that they weren't there, I mean, you could stand anywhere in that rally, look in every direction, and you would see an I heart oil sand sign. And so if we pretend that, that those many, 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 many people were not there, then I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. However, sometimes we do, I think, exaggerate um, our own, you know, our own vices, our own, um, okay, so, the nice story. This is where I'm similar to that. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, three blocks away from my house, a, um, a young, deranged uh, man 
drove his car into a police officer, stabbed him multiple times, got a U-Haul, drove downtown, drove down many pedestrians. And you know, growing up in a, in a Muslim household, um, coming of age around 9-11, you know, I never thought that that would ever come close to where I live, and it inched and inched and inched and inched, all while you know, the Western world was becoming increasingly Islamophobic and racist. And, you know, I'm seeing policies um, in the United States and ideas in Canada. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll, it's gonna be a long time before I forgive the Canadian government, or the, sorry, the, the Conservative Party for the, the campaign that they ran in 2015. I mean, that was just dark. So I feared the worst. And then the next day, I heard that there was going to be a rally in Churchill Square. Um, and I, like, is it for, like, it's, is it for the victims? Like, is it, is it, is it you know, an anti-terrorism? Like, what, what is it? So I go there, and it was um, hundreds and hundreds of people on a really, really, really cold September yeah, day. I was there. Yeah, it was cold. <laughs> it, it literally started snowing as we were leaving. And um, all these people came together with this very vague but cohesive message of, we will not be divided. And so on stage, you had people from uh, various Muslim communities, um, Christian communities, uh, multiple ethnicities, but the crowd was actually largely white. And they kind of saw through the bullshit uh, act that that young man did. And, and they also predicted what some of the, the backlash could be. And their message was to both, both the radicals, um, both the, the Islamist radicals who might be watching this and the white supremacists who might be watching this. And their message was, don't fuck with us. We will not be divided. And I turned around and there were two, two people, count them, two counter protesters. Yep. And one of them had a sign that said, no Sharia in Canada, S-H-A-R-I-A-H. So misspelled. And those Shana were the was Shania or Shania? <laughs> no Shania I'm done with that. in Alberta. Very I'm controversial. Done with that group. The, the country crowd <laughs> despised these people. Um, and that that was one of those moments where I realized the Alberta I thought I knew, that's not real. And the Alberta that I want to exist is the real one. And that made me super proud. Now, what I would love to see is that message of we will not be divided. Um, I'd love to see us extrapolate that to the rest of Canada because I think that Albertans, unfortunately, are very comfortable with dividing themselves from the rest of this country when actually we rely on each other very, very strongly. And we can't get too self-absorbed thinking that we can do this on our own and Albert's secessionism actually stands a chance. We can't delude ourselves because that, that um, unity that I saw in Edmonton um, on a local level is even more important on a national level, and it doesn't matter what it has to do with. Um, when it comes to pipelines, it's the same thing. So, Omar, to add to your story, thank you um, and your experience, which is moving in Edmonton, I just want to add a positive thing. That very similar circumstance happened to a mosque in Cold Lake. Was it two years ago? And uh, it was, um, there was, it was vandalized and um, horrible messages were painted on it. So the rural Albertans who I represent drove from an hour in all directions and probably, yep, pretty homogeneous in color, maybe even in gender, and from a variety of faith groups and they all came there to deliver the exact same message and help the repair of the mosque. I hesitate to say what it is in case there's rules breaking for painting or whatever, because I wasn't actually there. But that, yeah. that happened out there too, and so. And they repaired it like new by the end of the afternoon. Okay, so I guess this yeah. is, and so when it happened that's again, Alberta. And it happened again to the same mosque, and the people came out. And, and that's Alberta. Again. So, yes. positive story, but the fact that it happened again 
not that long after. Also, we have to like we we have to confront that as well. Sure, and people who value and uh, value the you know equal dignity and sanctity of every individual human being and freedom as the underpinning and peace, right, as the underpinning of our society. I agree with you. We have to keep confronting it. Now, we could go on for a long time, but a. I promised the people in the audience that they could ask questions and the people on the live stream that they could ask questions. And B, there are many donuts in the hallway and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and pierogies on skewers. Um, so we are going to have some questions. I'm going to ask you, in deference to the need to get to the snacks, to keep your questions short, to make them questions. Maybe one day you will be panelists, but this is not your night. Uh, <laughs> So if you could make the questions short, uh, and if you could speak up, I'm going to repeat the question into the microphone so that the people who are watching the live stream and who are listening to the podcast later can hear it. So, yes. If we're going to change our story and, and write the, the future that we want to, that most of you on the panel are speaking the same thing, how is one to do that? Somebody's got to start, and then it's supposed to grow. All right. Mm -hmm. So the question, in case you didn't hear it, is how do we change the story? How, if we need to change the way we tell our story, mm -hmm. how, how do we start that? And I want to I get an answer not from everybody to every question, mm -hmm. but maybe from Diana and from Jared mm -hmm. to this one. Diana, how, how, do we, how do we start to reframe our story? Well, um, just want to say that we have to because I come from a different paradigm, like on my worldview, the worldview of my people, the people I represent, we look at the world differently than what your liberal ideological paradigm is based on. And so we don't have the same, the same, uh, uh, I'm not too sure what they, what those divisions such as racism, that's not in our paradigm. Our paradigm is there are two-legged entities on this globe, and we are a family. And that's what I called you in my opening remarks, Nwagumagandik. That means we are all related. We are all related, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. <laughs> um, so racism, what it does is it serves to uh, marginalize people, and that division in our case, like indigenous folks, is we become racialized and that becomes the narrative and we are domestic under this umbrella. We are not that. We, it, it, it shrouds the fact that we are nations. We are nations of peoples that made international recognized treaties. And so how do we unpack? We, and this is where we are at an advantage because we can deconstruct your paradigm because it's not ours. And we can repack it um, and make the, the isms less than in place of those um, attributes of humanity which come right here from all of us have this frontal lobe, which <laughs> is about empathy, which is about um, higher order thinking, about consciousness, about uh, looking at each other as a brother and a sister and treating each other that way. And that can be done daily and acknowledging people and having courteousness towards each other. And I think that's something that Canada prides itself in <laughs> globally. It's seen as the peacemaker uh, nation state. So let's put that into reality and not continue to per perpetuate the lies <laughs> about where we come from. Let's look at each other as a human family. And I think that's a really basic, simple thing to do that everybody can participate in. That's beautiful. Jared? I like this idea of a paradigm. So I, I wrote a, a book a while back called Code Politics, where I looked at over 800 pieces of campaign literature from dominant parties in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And the code of Alberta politics, shouldn't surprise a lot of you, uh, revolved around themes like freedom, prosperity, civil society, 
Alberta autonomy and so on. And you, to your question about how do we retell the story, I think we need to use the same code, but we need to spin it in a different way. So instead of talking about freedom from government, we can start talking about freedom to do things in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Instead of talking about prosperity first and the old prosperity doctrine that connects wealth with goodness and so on. Prosperity and, gospel, yeah. Right, that's the old prosperity gospel. Uh, born out in prosperity bucks, um, the Ralph bucks that we heard before. Um, we need to start talking about prosperity for all. We believe in prosperity, but why don't we start talking about prosperity for all? We talk about civil society quite a bit. That's part of Alberta's code. But we don't talk about the communitarian aspects that we just talked about on stage here. That there is actually value in civil society coming together and doing volunteer work, whether it's cleaning up a mosque or, or engaging in other activities. Uh, I think we need to talk about Alberta autonomy, Alberta first, which is part of the code, and, and, but spin it in talking about how Alberta is a contributing member of the Confederation family and not keep threatening to leave it. Um, so I think that we take the same code uh, that we've inherited, but we use it in a different way, and, and it does work. It does work. Rachel Notley's 2015 campaign proves that prosperity for all was a message that resonated. One of the reasons why, she, well, that wasn't the only reason, but she fell off that message and it didn't resonate as much with people in 2019. All right, there is, yeah. yes. Uh, first of all, thank you to the panel and all for the discussion and being here tonight. It's very encouraging to hear. I would ask, what is one concrete suggestion to action you would offer to give us today when we wake up tomorrow that we can All right, I'm gonna, I think that is a good question for Doug. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Me too. Well, yeah, no, yeah, I'll ask, yeah, I'll, I'll ask Doug I and Shannon that question. I'm no, going to tie Doug. both the questions together because I, I think that it's not one person that's going to change the conversation and tell that story. It takes every single person in Alberta, and it needs to be a recognition of where we were, where we are, where we're going the good and the bad aspects. So with the, the, the Greta sticker, I mean, you could chalk it up to one person who did it, but it got a long ways before somebody said that's not good. There is a culture of toxic masculinity that allowed it to prevail. It doesn't do any good to deny it, but it, if you expose it, it may give a lot more men who are scared to speak up mm -hmm. confidence to say, no, that's unacceptable before it ever gets on Twitter or something like that. And so if you ask me, one thing, start to change the story by having real conversations about what's bad and what's good and the challenges people are facing and the opportunities this province has to have a positive future. So if you're gonna do anything, don't let this be the end. The first thing you should do is have your own little panel around the breakfast table with your entire family and then at lunchtime and then in the grocery store and carry on this conversation because the only way it's gonna change is if we talk about it. We, we shine lights on the bad parts and expose them and we, we talk about what the future is going to be of this province in a positive light. So that's why every single Albertan owns the creation of that story. It's not up to the CBC. It's not up to, to some one person. It's not even up to one politician that sits in the legislature. It's up to Albertans to create that story. All right, I saw another hand in the back there. Yeah. Um, my question revolves around leadership. Um, what I'm hearing, and I, I really want to One thing that I'm getting out of it is that we Albertans are meeting a lot of different teams. Um, I've always used the definition of leaders as being leadership is about caring for people. And so I throw a question about out at you what kind of leadership should we be looking for? And everybody in this room has a choice in who we follow. All right, so the question was, what kind of leadership should we be looking for to address some of these issues? Um, well, I think that's a good question for Shannon, who's an elected politician. Goodness. <laughs> um, well, I think you touched on it. It is the caring issue. You know, people use this word, uh, like, about authentic mm. politicians a lot. 
I kind of hate that because it's come a bit of a shtick. It's like the word synergy, you know, some of the, I don't know, maybe <laughs> I'm talking to people who love it, but these are the kinds of things that make give me creepy crawlies. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think you've hit the nail on the head uh, that you should be identifying uh, leaders and elected leaders who do care and, and who, uh, you know, can demonstrate a level of nuance. And I think the number one thing you need to look for is people who are servant leaders and that that is their, you know, that that's, approach to, that's their approach to their job as elected representatives, um, to serve the people who sent them there. Now, I, I'm sure that Doug could have something to add on this, and I'm just going to, <laughs> to, uh, to try to make this short. And Doug, can you now, well, I'm gonna volunteer your support on my comment here. Um, it's a real challenge for elected people um, that's sometimes why I'm very jealous of, of uh, Paula. <laughs> it's difficult to communicate with nuance and in a comprehensive way, you know, the way the structures are set up, even in social media, like it, it's, it's changed things. And I, I worry, on one hand, I, um, I like that social media has democratized uh, political discourse. On another, I would say it does a, a disservice um, in many ways, and it's very difficult for politicians. So let me just say it this way. Like back when you didn't, and I don't know, Doug, if you want to jump in and rescue me and help me here, but if, um, but I, I worked for, a, for an elected rep a long time ago. Uh, well, not that long, because I am just turned 40 in December, but, um, you know, we, the social media thing didn't happen. So an issue would break, and as an elected representative with policy experts or nonpartisan um, public servants, or the variety of people you're looking for to give you advice to make your best calculation as to what to do as an elected rep, which is generally a consideration of your riding, your personal convictions, um, and all the, the vast array of information you're exposed to to do your very best to take a position on something. Um, you had some time to do that, right? With due diligence and in a, you know, in a, in a comprehensive, really rigorous, thorough way. And you could speak in a more complicated, comprehensive way, because media would allow and enable you to do that too. And I would just suggest that while, you know, what I've said you should look for in a leader um, is also difficult. I don't want to overstate how easily it is done or that, you, or that you, if you get the impression that most politicians aren't doing that, it's not, I would suggest to you it's not necessarily because of intent but it is related to the realities uh, in which we communicate and are making decisions. And I think that actually it's getting more and more difficult. And I really do worry about that for political discourse in the future. I think Doug desperately wants to jump in. And then I do too. Like, you know what I'm trying so, to say? Yeah, I, I okay. do. Um, you know what, I, I would just say that um, I think politics is due for a revolution. This whole, you know, I, I always thought when people were stuck on ideology, they're, they found a solution when they don't understand the problem yet. We need more ideas and less ideology. I don't care if you're left or right. You get too far on one side or the other, and you quit thinking and quit being creative with your problem solving. So uh, my, my rule of thumb, if you're looking for real leaders, that's who I'm going to be looking for, is people who are reaching across the aisle, reaching across the province, reaching across the country to build something. And if all they want is division, mm -hmm. and all they're going to build is walls, mm -hmm. they're not the leaders you want. I just want to add to um, what I think we should be looking for in leaders are leaders who appeal to our best values, to the best in us. Mm. Things like in our ability to persevere, um, our optimism. Um, what I don't, what I think we should reject, and I don't think we do that very well, is leaders who appeal to some of the worst in us, our fears, our, um, I mean, our, our anger, our rage, sense of entitlement, um, the very human, uh, you know, the, the very human thing of being self-absorbed. I think that is, that, that's not something that, um, that leaders should uh, should appeal to, and our our anger is not something that I it's not something that I like seeing whipped up and weaponized, mm -hmm. and I see that a lot, and uh, we saw that a lot in the last um, couple of years. So that's what I look for and don't look for in a leader. 
I'll, yeah. I'll, be, re I'll be really quick. You, you, can fi you, can, you, can, you can find people that are acting in a tribal way, whether it be ideological, partisan, or other way, when they're talking about us versus them. And when they're using warlike me metaphors, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I think this, as a this person practicing that whole elected role right now, um, I would caution around some, like all of us, around stereotypes or maybe um, attaching what we assume to be motives or in the mind and heart and soul of what you are seeing. Um, I just say that because I take very seriously my role to be a channel for the people who sent me to Ottawa to do that job. You know I do, Paula. We've known each other for a long time. So I, I, um, I'm not, I feel it deeply. I actually have some difficulty compartmentalizing what is going on in my riding and to the people then that I represent. Uh, emotionally, I can't separate myself. So from that, I take that job very seriously. And here is the reality right now, 84% of people sent me to Ottawa to do this job for them in my riding. And I do my best to represent the diversity in everybody in my riding, because that's my core responsibility. But at the end of the day, my job really is to speak for them. And it's not going to be the case in every community or every region or every place in Ottawa. But I can tell you on some of the major issues, certainly, that we are dealing with, uh, there is absolutely a consensus in my riding on many of these things. And it crosses demographics, it crosses whether they're in cities or rural areas or the small towns, it crosses um, ages, it crosses the whole thing. And that's partly why this alienation that we're talking about and these growing you know, um, conversations about the mechanics of what different futures for Alberta would look like is happening. And I just have to tell you in my backyard, which is unique, um, and there are a couple of other areas around the, the province that are, that are like this, um, it is a consensus, and it's not falling along, you know, the different kinds of people that are there. I just say it again. Right. This, this, that's, sorry, this, that's the chore. That's I, want to, I want to say something. It's it's not a slight on you because I know you're a federal candidate, but uh, I don't think it's helping when our premier uses terms like leftist green radicals. I think that plays right into the us versus them that Jared was talking about, because he's talking about protesters who are exercising a civil right based on their own personal values, how they see the world, how they see the planet, how they see the earth, how they see, um, you know, markets, the economies, what, what their priorities and values are, and then just immediately marginalizing them in such a, you know, pejorative way. Um, you know, I expect that on Twitter. I don't expect that from my premiere. I think that's shameful. All right. There's a woman in the audience, in the front row here who's been trying to ask a question for a long time, so I'm yes. going <laughs> to My name is Sarah. I'm the leader of the Alberta Hummingbird Project on Facebook. We are a bunch of people with varying disabilities, most of us like me, with invisible disabilities who've been denied services and programs for over 20 years since the climb days. When I came here, the programs actually benefited people just like me, whether you had a full diagnosis or not. I didn't get diagnosed until I moved to Edmonton 10 years ago. What I find in Edmonton is bigotry towards people just like me. I get called a liability when it comes to every job I come into. All right. So did you have a, a specific yes. question? Did you guys ever bother to come to the disabled community and talk to us? Nobody in government talks to us. They just slash and slash and slash upon programs since the 90s, since I got here. Mm. Right. So the question so in my the writing, I have a very close relationship with a number of advocacy groups. Um, including, uh, for example, SPAN and St. Paul, um, and uh, I work with them regularly, yeah, but Edmonton, certainly Edmonton reps, I guess, would need to answer about that. Okay. Um, it, is, it is a real challenge for people with disabilities yeah. to be represented, and I, and I know that. Totally. Um, and that is something, whether the issues are municipal, provincial, or federal, is one of the frustrations I feel as a senator because people write to me and in the rarefied air of the Senate it is difficult for me to provide that kind of that kind of support what about talking to one of us who has ideas yeah. that yeah. work yeah mm -hmm. yeah I think that's a really good idea mm -hmm. now Ame do we have we have no questions from the good people on the live stream I'm very disappointed with you people on the live stream <laughs> um, but I think okay yeah. I think you wanted to get in on the no no there's uh, this, this young okay. gentleman there I think S stand up. Be loud. Probably best dressed by Paul and Omar, but 
all generally talk about how we find this idea in our head of what a typical burden is, and that story wasn't shared in general consensus. So someone is telling us that story, and we looked for both media, so we told the story, we mentioned the CBC, they told another story. I think the media is telling a specific story, so in like two years or less, did you solve journalism? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, all right, so I, I, I will answer this, and then I'm, I'm going to throw it to Omar. I mean, I don't think it is a secret that journalism, conventional mainstream media, is undergoing an economic uh, disruption. <laughs> I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking for the polite word for it, um, that has fractured media markets, that has fractured media economies. And when I started work at the Edmonton Journal, uh, there were, I like to say, because there's an old yearbook from back then, there were 40 reporters in the city room just reporting on mm. municipal news, mm. and now I think there are 10. Mm. So every mainstream media organization in this country is under extraordinary economic and, and human resources pressures. And I think that, that at the same time, they're being called upon to report 24 hours a day, breaking news online, um, without as much time for reflection as we had back in the in the uh, you know antediluvian days uh, when you know when I actually put the news in the paper. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's very difficult because you're going, you're forced to like run for clicks, run for easy hits, and so the stories powerful narratives that are boiled down into memes and tweets have viral currency. And those are the things that, that get exponentially shared. And it leads to a real diminution in the quality of discourse. I can't solve journalism. I'm pretty sure that giving subsidies to failing large media corporations is not a good plan. Right on. Um, and, uh, you know, as somebody who served on the Senate Communications Committee and hopes to get back on that committee, I have real concerns about where public policy directions are going. But if I could solve journalism, I would be the president of Post Media. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps, you know, I'd be... Well, maybe you could work on that too. No, I, I think <laughs> not. Um, but, I mean, Omar has, has been that rare creature, somebody who's made a career as a freelance writer based in Edmonton. Uh, I mean, do you have... Do you have any? I've actively sought out stories that um, can, sort of counter stories to uh, about Alberta and Edmonton. Um, you know, I my I, you know I, I worked I moved to Edmonton um, in 2006, and up until now, um, so I sort of like came at a good time when there was a lot of you know moving to Alberta, a lot going on in Alberta, a lot of mystique around Alberta. And so it was a good time to be a freelancer. And um, I found that a lot of times the assignments I would get from outside the province um, asked, f you know, they, they sort of suggested one narrative that they thought was, and then I would sort of show them the truth, which was sort of a counter narrative. So for example, um, this, this is an assignment I got from The Guardian when um, Ted Cruz won the, the mm -hmm. first primary in the United States. He was born in Calgary. And so they wanted me to uh, check out Calgary and write about how elated Albertans were <laughs> that the next president <laughs> might actually be an Albertan. And I could not find a single right. Albertan yes. who liked Ted Cruz. I talked to conservatives <laughs> like, Conservative poly policy maker, makers who were like, yeah, that guy's garbage, that guy's dangerous. <laughs> the only person I could find who liked Ted Cruz was actually a liberal, and the only reason that he liked him, he's like, yeah, you know, we're around the same age, we were born in the hosp same hospital about a week apart, and I just think it would be kind of cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> the <laughs> now I can, I, can, I can do that, um, and I can pursue the stories that I want to pursue, um, but it's kind of a different thing when you're when you're in a newsroom and um, in, a, in a, a you know a wilting newsroom as well, and especially if if you're in a post media newsroom, which has taken even more of a right turn, which I didn't think was possible. But this is like from top down. Um, <laughs> this is a really I'm going to say something provocative and controversial as a journalist. 
Um, we talk about what we should do to support journalism we like. We should subscribe and uh, you know pay for their Patreon, do the things that we can't do to financially support them, and we should do that. We don't talk about what we should do for the media that we don't like and what you think is actively dangerous um, or counterproductive or whatever. You know, whether it's the rebel or increasingly, I don't want to compare post media directly to the rebel, but they ha have a partisan agenda from the top down. That's the truth. What you can do, if you'd like, is download one of those add-ins onto your browser that blocks websites, and you can add those newspapers there, and you'll never pay them a cent, because you'll never read or visit their site or read one of their articles. If you want to go to that extreme, go for it. That's what you can do. Thank Reward you. the ones that are doing journalism responsibly, and penalize the ones that are not. And I'm sorry, Paula, because I know that Edmonton Journal still has a very special place in your heart, and I have a lot of friends who work there, and I feel very conflicted about saying what I just said. But to me, I don't think that we should reward that kind of, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that we should reward unethical journalism. All right, I think we have time for exactly one last question. Um, oh, there's one here, and there's one. There's, I, have, I have conflicting last Sorry, Jared questions. just showed me a picture of uh, Kenny and Ted Cruz together. <laughs> You didn't ask every Calgarian. <laughs> he was in Ottawa at the time, in <laughs> fairness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so. Uh, all oh, right, was that the so deal breaker for you? Jason Kenny likes Ted Cruz. You're like, I'm done with him. <laughs> all right, so you, said, you think you have the last question there. I think I have the last question here. I don't know. Maybe I have two last questions, but there are mini donuts and there are pierogies. And I told the caterer pierogies. to be ready at nine. Yeah, there. I, I, I know when I, I when I when I ordered the the catering, they sent me the menu, and I'm very mindful that I'm spending your Senate tax dollars. So I did not order any booze. I'm sorry uh, to tell you this, but I did not think it was a good look for me to use my Senate budget to buy alcohol. You're right. However, on the caterer's menu, one of the options they offered was a, a canapé that was mini pierogies and slices of kubasa on skewers. And so, of course, there is hummus, but, um, <laughs> but and there are bison sliders, but there will also be mini pierogies on That's sticks and mini donuts. So I, I did my best to be, to be on point. Um, all right, who has the best last question? That person's closest to the pierogies, so should we not go with this person? <laughs> oh, you're going to defer? Okay. All right, Cynthia, you get to pick your person. Uh, you can type your title several times. So, okay. so uh, you talked about that, that mindset of what, what an Albertan is, and that it's more diverse than what, what the rest of Canada really does see. But that really doesn't still change the fact that when it comes to partisan politics, we're still defined by one party. I'm wondering kind of how can we politically ensure that the, the multiple voices that are Albertans are heard and throughout the political process? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, I'm going to take that one first, and then I'm going to throw it out to other people. Uh, I'm a nonpartisan independent senator. I represent Alberta. Um, technically, I don't represent Edmonton and Northern Alberta, but that's sort of functionally how it works out. Mm -hmm. I recognize that even though, um, apart from Heather McPherson, the NDP MP who represents this part of the city, uh, Albertans, including Edmontonians, elected a straight slate of conservatives, that in our first past the post system, that doesn't mean that every Edmontonian is a conservative, and it's one of those conundrums of the same city that elected a nearly straight slate of New Democrats provincially elected conservatives federally. I'm doing what I can as a senator to try and represent the diversity of this community. This event is a small part of that. But it is a challenge. I mean, the flip answer is to say, vote for different other people. <laughs> but um, but it, it, it is a challenge. And, and, and I'm sure that, um, you know, in, in Shannon's writing, as she's pointed out, she, you know, she won by a landslide. But but I, I know she's aware too that that, that that doesn't mean that every single person in Alberta shares, shares that perspective. And it is, it is tough to make sure all those voices are, are heard and, and, and heard well. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Jared, you, you lean towards the microphone. Maybe that's just means no, you well, want to No, well, I'm going to go back to Omar. It's something that Omar said that it, it really resonated with me. The, he said, the Alberta I want is the Alberta that exists. So I wouldn't say you need to go out and vote for somebody different. I say you need to go out and vote. Voter turnout yes, that alone would, in this province is, is that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I, I would, I keep coming back to this pair of women that we met at McEwen University when we were doing our focus groups. Both of them drew Joe uh, in terms of their Albertans. And I asked, well, why did you draw Joe? And both of them said, well, that's my dad. They weren't sisters. They were both different dads. <laughs> um, and I said, well, why didn't you draw your mom? So I never thought of that. You said draw an Albertan. So if Omar's right, that, that the, the Alberta that we want is the Alberta that exists, part of what comes from political, or what starts political change is getting over the hurdle of what we think is acceptable or politically correct, or what we expect is gonna happen at the outcome of an election. I think a lot of people are held back from voting the way that they want to vote because they don't think that that vote matters. So I think, what I try to do in my research is to expose the, the disjunction between the myths and the reality. And what average voters like you folks in the room do with that is up to you. This has been wonderful. I want to thank all of the panelists for taking part tonight. Doug, Omar, Diana, Shannon, and Jared. This has just been such a privilege to host. Thank you all for coming out. Thank, thank you. you all for coming here this yeah. evening. Thank everybody on the live stream who's been watching. Thank all of you in podcast land who are listening to this sometime in the future. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I want to thank again the folks at Studio Theatre who have made uh, all of this event possible very seamlessly and wonderfully. And now I invite you to eat pierogies on sticks. <laughs>